Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Tunisia Office of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. I'm speaking from Tunis. So I wish uh, those of you who have just broken the fast Hashri Bitkum. My name is Siham Lamin and I'm the Administrative and Program Manager of the Harvard uh, CMS Tunisia Office. It's a renewed pleasure to welcome you to our webinar series, Tunisia Newsreel, Notes from the Ground, a series dedicated to post-2011 Tunisia and that aims at hearing from guest speakers from diverse backgrounds about their views on the political, economic, social, or cultural situation in the country. For this session, we will tackle more regional subjects and hear about the Tunisian-Libyan relations at the time of Libya's rebuilding and national reconciliation. It's a great pleasure and privilege to welcome Mr. Khmais Jhinawi, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Tunisia, who will be in conversation with Professor William Gunara, our Director, Professor of Arabic at Harvard, Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. Professor Gunara knows both countries, Tunisia and Libya, well, not only because he lived and has friends in both, but also from their literary and journalistic production, uh, whether created locally or within uh, diasporic contexts. Uh, allow me to very briefly introduce our guest today. Mr. Khmais Jhinawi uh, served as Minister of <coughs> Foreign Affairs of Tunisia from 2016 to 2020. Formerly, he held high positions in the Tunisian diplomacy within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as ambassador to Tunisia or as advisor to the President of the Tunisian Republic. He currently so he is currently founder uh, and chairperson of the Tunisian Council for International Relations, a think tank that aims at conducting research and studies in fields related to Tunisia's international relations and cooperation in the Maghreb, the Mediterranean and beyond. Mr. Jhinawi formerly served as ambassador to Russia, Ukraine and the former republics of the Soviet Union from, 20, from 2007 to, 20, uh, to 2011. Ambassador to the UK and Ireland from 1999 to 2004, head of the Tunisian Interest Office in Tel Aviv from 1996 to 1997, Minister Councillor at the Embassy of, the, of Tunisia in Seoul, South Korea from 1991 to 1994, and First Secretary at the Embassy of Tunisia in New Delhi from 1982 to 1986. Mr. Jhinawi holds the highest national distinction that can be awarded by the Tunisian head of state as commander of the Republic Order, as well as numerous other international decorations. Mr. Jhinawi, it's a pleasure and honor to have you with us. Before I turn the floor to Professor Granara, I would need to mention a few logistical points. This talk will adopt the conversation format. There will also be time for questions by the end of the hour. Please ask your questions in writing in the chat box at the bottom of the screen and I will read them to Mr. Shinawi and to Professor Granara. Without further ado, let me turn the floor over to our guest. Professor Granara, the floor is yours. Uh, good, e good evening, everybody, or good afternoon for those of us in the United States and uh, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everybody. It's a great pleasure to meet you, um, Mr. Ambassador. Um, and I thought I would start off as you know, in the United States, or you may or may not know in the United States, we know very little about Libya. And much of what we do know has often been um, basically through the prism of the character of, um, of uh, Muammar al-Qaddafi and his, his uh, very uh, turbulent relationships with the United States. But he is a, uh, Tunis, Tunisia and Libya has a much richer uh, and a deeper uh, relationship uh, actually between the two countries. And first, I'd like to ask you just if you could comment as, as a first prelim preliminary question, um, how do you see at this particular time now today, the bilateral relationships between Tunisia and Libya on the governmental, on the state level? Well, uh, Professor Ganara, thank you very much. First, thank you very much for hosting me. I am really uh, honored to have this opportunity to talk to the audience of the uh, Center of the Middle Eastern Studies of Harvard University. You are asking me tonight to speak uh, about a subject which is very dear to me because I had the privilege to work on it for almost four years 
during my mandate as a foreign minister. Tunisia and Libya, both of them, both countries, they are uh, 10 years after the uh, respective uprising. Both countries, they are in the middle of a crisis. Uh, Libya is indeed, has indeed inaugurated a new government, new interim government lately, and uh, with which, with the task of uh, uh, trying to uh, secure and unify the country and prepare the ground for general election by the end of this year. Tunisia also is struggling to consolidate its democratic process, its democratic, in a, in a context of serious economic, social, and financial crisis, and uh, still testing the political system which was set up by the 2014 constitution about the relationship between the different executive branches of the executive power, as well as with the, uh, le, le, the parliament. So you see, we are, uh, though we are in a different stage of our transition, we still, you know, we are in a transition situation, both the countries. Uh, today, uh, you asked me if uh, about the relation between the two government, since I am not in, in, in the affairs now, since I am not in the ministry, I can't really tell you, I can just uh, give you an idea as an observer. Uh, since, uh, the inauguration of the new government in Libya, the president paid a visit, short visit for one day, where he met uh, all prominent personalities in Libya. But since then, unfortunately, we had the minister of the new minister of foreign affairs, Libyan foreign minister, who visited Tunisia, I think, uh, two weeks ago. But since then, we didn't have much of contacts and the interaction between the two governments, which is quite curious because. As we will be seeing during this discussion, uh, uh, for Tunisia, the Libyan crisis of, uh, is of a paramount uh, importance. Uh, it impacts our uh, political, the success of our political transition, but it also it has it, it has its impact on our. Uh, economic revival, and of course, on our security. So what was expected from our government is to be more proactive with the new leadership in Libya and try to initiate contacts and see how we can continue, you know, the work which we have started actually a few years ago, how to try to interact with the Libyans and see how we can help them. Uh, I mean, help each other but uh, since we have much more experience now, 10 years experience of political transition, we can be of some use, I think, to the new leadership, which is preparing election by the end of this year. Thank you for this. Uh, can you give us um, an idea of um, the, the, his, the, the historical ties, or I should say the economic relations between uh, Tunisia and uh, and Libya. Um, where, in what sectors of the economy, or how, in economic terms, may we see the the strength in in, in Tunisian Libyan relations, as they were prior to um, 2011 and post 2011? Yeah. Before 2011, Libya used to be the second partner, foreign partner of Tunisia, immediately after the European Union. We uh, made almost 2.5 billion dinars uh, exchange, you know, uh, trade exchange between the two countries. Uh, Libyan tourists, we received every year almost 1,700,000 uh, tourists per year coming from Libya. Uh, then uh, we had uh, almost 100,000 Tunisian living in Libya and working there and sending back to Tunisia their uh, remittance. Uh, so relations are so, were so important to Tunisia and especially when uh, 
Libya used to be under the local based sanctions and Tunisia being the next neighbor of Libya, Tunisian businessmen, you know, uh, started operating on the Libyan market and started knowing the different mechanism of working on this, on that market. Uh, since 2011, unfortunately, most of these, you know, uh, uh, most of these cooperation has evaporated. Uh, now it's around 300 million, 350 million exchange between the two countries, uh, which is nothing compared to the potential uh, of uh, between uh, potential, the Libyan potential for the Tunisian uh, op uh, operators. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done there because we have a very strong and solid legal framework with Libya which has been into force uh, since Muammar Gaddafi regime, that legal framework could be updated and Tunisian could be immediately operating on the Libyan market and taking part in the reconstruction process going, there, uh, going on there. Um, I, I wanted to ask a, a follow up on the question of um, uh, economic exchanges. Um, we know that tourism has suffered in the world in you know in the last 10 years not so much suffered but it, there are the, because of certain events tourism has uh, the industry has been um, has been damaged and also now with covid going on tourism or libyan tourism in some ways could you say that it evolved into something different in that now in tunisia you have something in the way of a permanent a community, a Libyan community of residents, I think is the word ressortisans uh, uh, that are in Libya. And there are now second and third generations of Libyans. You are absolutely yeah. right. And could you talk a little bit about those Libyan communities that are residing in Lebanon? Uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in, in Tunisia today. I just taught a course on Lebanese. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Professor Granara, you know, uh, when I talked about tourism in 2011, it's not the same kind of tourism we are receiving today. Uh, since 2011, or around 2 million foreigners and Libyans, you know, fled the violence going on in Libya and came to Tunisia. Some of them, of course, the foreigners, they, were they went back to their own countries and a few hundred thousand of our Libyans brothers, they settled down in Tunisia. Uh, they settled down and well, they were well received by the Tunisian as part you know, of the same community because there are a lot of uh, similar, uh, you know, uh, similarities between uh, Libyan and Tunisian and those human being strong bonds existed for centuries. So when they fled Libya in 2011, they were well received by the Tunisian family. They settled and rented houses, you know, among the Tunisians. And they, even some of them, they have sent their children to Tunisian schools. So those, they are no more tourists, they are resident. But unfortunately, the World Bank, in a report published in 2015, assessing the impact of such uh, the Libyan crisis on Tunisia, they have notes besides, you know, the reduction of the remittance of the Tunisians living in Libya, 60,000 of Tunisian who were living in Libya, they have left Libya in 2011 and came back to Tunisia. So we are now almost not, not more than 30,000. We don't have more than 30,000 Tunisian living there approximately, we don't have the, the exact figure, but uh, the World Bank uh, ass assessed and estimates that uh, the Libyan crisis was responsible for almost 24% of the deceleration of the Tunisian economic growth during 2011-2015. That figure, of course, now almost doubled. Uh, it's it's uh, because, for the reason which I have mentioned, 
because we don't do any more trade as we used to do, because many Tunisian companies who were operating with Tunisia, they have already left Tunisia. And the Libyans who are living with us, and actually we don't know exactly the number of those Libyans because they come without a visa. You know, we don't have the Tunis Libyan, they can enter Tunisia with a uh, visa free. Some of them, they come for medical treatment. So they stay and they go back and then they come back. They rent houses, they leave, they leave their families here, they go back to Libya and they come back. So these uh, Libyans who are considered, you know, as part of the Tunisian uh, society setup, they benefit, they enjoy the same benefit as the other Tunisians. Uh, of course, you know, from all these uh, subsidiaries for oil, for food, for all, all the uh, subsidiaries given to Tunisians by the Tunisian government are also uh, the, our Libyan brothers, like any other, you know, uh, uh, foreigners uh, living in Tunisia, they enjoy the same. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, tourism is no more Still, there are some Libyans who come here to enjoy some holidays in the hotels. And if you go to uh, uh, the suburb of Tunis, many hotels, they are full with the Libyans uh, coming for business or for uh, leisure, but still it's not the same number and they don't come for the same purpose. Um, I Thank you very much. It's quite interesting. I wanted to just um, go into two areas. Uh, can you talk a little bit more in detail about what might be considered or might be termed as medical tourism? That is to say, over the years, the number of Tunisians coming into, uh, the number of Libyans, I'm sorry, coming into Tunisia to have access to medical care. And we know that medical care in Tunisia is quite good. Um, uh, can you talk about how that's impacted the medical infrastructure, so to speak? Is it helped or is it putting a burden, especially nowadays with COVID? Uh, no, you see, Tunisia used to be for quite a long time now as a medical destination for Libyans willing, you know, to go for uh, treatment uh, abroad. Uh, most of these Libyans, they are taken care of by the Libyan government. Uh, so since, unfortunately, Libya witnessed instability in the political governors in the last few years, that impact on the possibility of, you know, reimbursing the clinics in Tunisia by the Libyan authorities. So we still, we, uh, we, we have quite uh, important debt, uh, I mean, private clinics, they have important figure of hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, which are still to be uh, paid because unfortunately of the instability known by the uh, Libyan government. But still, Tunisia has always opened its hospitals as well as clinics to all the Libyans coming for legal treatment, uh, medical treatment. And uh, uh, even uh, within when the war was going on in Libya, uh, we used to receive, you know, injured people from both sides. We don't put them in the same clinics, but they receive the same treatment. And uh, there are even some private clinics in Sfax, for example, in the south of Tunisia, who are completely, you know, exclusively reserved for Libyan uh, uh, patients. It does, does, is there a, um, any kind of reaction on the part of Tunisians who may feel that Libyans having more access to dollars or with, with more money or with subsidies from their own government, that they're getting better attention, um, medical attention or better medical care than Tunisians? Is there any tension on that level? No, uh, let me say clearly that uh, all these Libyans who came here as a tourist or as a medical uh, patient, you know, mm -hmm. they never made any problems and they were well integrated within the uh, so society setup. Uh, of course, as I said, there are depth uh, mm -hmm. for private clinics, but uh, that does not mean that uh, 
we have stopped receiving, you know, uh, patients, or there is a kind of resentment from the population towards Libyans. Uh, uh, well, actually, we uh, once when I was a minister, they asked me about. They called me if there are Libyan refugees. We never considered Libyan as refugees. Uh, we uh, they were naturally received uh, by the Tunisian population. Uh, we Tunisia is the only country in the uh, among the seven countries surrounding Libya which kept its uh, border, its borders yes. open to Libyans, so they feel free whenever they want to come, you know, to for tourism or for medical treatment or even to uh, transit by Tunisia to travel abroad to other countries when the uh, airports in Libya were were closed at the time. That's, a, that's an important point that you make, that they don't carry a refugee status. Um, for instance, as we're seeing in other parts of the Arab world now with Syrians and Lebanon and Iraqis and Jordan, et cetera. So that's an interesting point. We never, we never, we never mentioned it as a refugees. We never claimed that to the international organization because we don't consider Libyans as refugees. We consider that they are here for, because they have problem back home. Because you know we are we have a history, a common history of Libyan coming here and Tunisian yep. coming to, going to Libya, particularly when Tunisia was under the French rule and the Libyan were under the Italian rule. So there is a tradition there, and uh, Libyans they are well accepted within the Tunisian society. Um, it's a very important point. Thank you. Tell me, do you do do the Tunisians have statistics, or do we have any idea as to what extent young um, Tunisians? Um, who uh, upon finishing their education, but who remain in Tunisia are entering into the workforce? Do, Tuni do young Libyans find employment? Uh, are, they, are they looking for employment in Tunisia? I don't think so. There are many Libyans who are businessmen. They are running business here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, to my knowledge, I don't see any Libyans, you know, seeking jobs. Uh, you know, for the government office or uh, uh, for a simple reason that those Libyans who are living in Tunisia, they continue to be paid, you know, by the central government in Libya. Most, uh, most of them, mm -hmm. most of them, they continue to receive their salaries or their pension uh, while living here. So uh, uh, I don't feel that there is any competition I see. for jobs. It, it, very interesting. Tell me, can you talk a little bit about the banking sector and to what extent the Libyans contribute to or are part of the banking system? We know that several years ago, uh, uh, and if I, if I remember correctly, in the, in the days of uh, Ben Ali, the banking system, the international banking grew to a great extent. Have the Libyans contributed to the banking system? Do they still invest in, in, in Tunisian banks? Yes, they are. Uh, they still... You know, they have, they, we have a common bank, uh, the Tunisian Libyan Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, an independent bank, but there are few private, private banks mm -hmm. uh, financed uh, totally by Libyan or, uh, you know, uh, jointly with the Tunisian businessmen. So uh, uh, they are also in the banking system. Uh, they uh, use freely their money, which they bring in, uh, of course, legally through the central bank. And there is uh, no problem in that uh, regard. I see. And and Libyans have access to depositing and withdrawing their money from the banks with no, uh, in the same degree of liberty and the same rules and regulations that Tunisians would. Yeah, absolutely. So that, there is no restriction for that. I see. Thank you. Very interesting. I, can I move over a little bit on education? But before I do that, it's always been my impression that Libyans are not francophone. Um, and uh, their second language, well, historically was, a t well, since the colonial period, either Italian, but more young Tunisians uh, gravitate towards learning English than they would French. Um, do you find that there's a language barrier or, I also heard, by the way, if I could say that some, some of my friends have told me that the level of Arabic, uh, in, especially among the doctors and the nurses in the 
clinics have gotten much better because they speak more Arabic with the Libyans than they do absolutely. French with the Tunisians. Yeah, absolutely. So the common language is Arabic, and I don't think any there is any barrier, language barrier between the two countries. You know, there are uh, in the south of Tunisia and Tatawin and uh, Midnin, uh, you find many, uh, even in the other uh, uh, cities, you find many uh, Tunisian of Libyan origin mm -hmm. and uh, Libyan of Tunisian origin. So uh, uh, the south of Tunisia, when Bengerden, Tatawin, mm -hmm. even the spoken language is quite similar, very similar to the one which is spoken by the Libyans. So there is no, uh, no problem of communication that. Uh, okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, if I could uh, just again move to another area in the area of education. Um, I know I've heard that while I was in Tunisia, the last couple of visits that I've been there, that there is now um, schools, um, elementary schools, Ibtidai and, and, and Thanawi, where, that are devoted to, uh, that are Libyan, but there's also Libyans who are integrating into the Tunisian system. Can you talk about, um, for instance, the levels of education from primary all the way to university, to what extent the Libyans are being educated in, in Tunisia? Frankly, I'm not very knowledgeable about this uh, kind of uh, subject, but just uh, to tell you that, the, of course, there are Libyan schools. Uh, there is the Libyan school, which is which has has been there even before 2011, and which is enrolling most of the Libyans uh, who uh, came after 2011. But still, there is no restriction, no restriction whatsoever for uh, Libyans who are willing to be enrolled in U Tunisian university or Tunisian lycees. Uh, with the condition, of course, that they should uh, learn French. And by the way, I found out there are many Libyans who do speak French now. Hmm. Uh, wow. A number of the Libyans who are speaking French is increasing, even among the, the, uh, uh, the elite now, mm -hmm. which is back in Tripoli after 2011, there are many Libyans who studied in the French school or in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, or uh, Belgium, and mm -hmm. who are back uh, in Libya, and, and they do speak uh, good mm -hmm. French. Besides, oh, like Tunisian speaking English, you know. It's, it's That's same. right, right. Yeah. It's becoming more of a universal. Uh, yeah. uh, how about um, at university? Do we do we know? Do we have any statistics as to how many uh, resident Libyans are entering into universities in Tunisia? Do we have any information on that? Honestly, honestly, I don't have for that. Uh, I, I was not, I didn't really try to, uh, to look at it. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of the language barrier, because university is still either Arabic or French in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. So I understand, I suspect that uh, particularly in the technical universities, you cannot find many Libyans because most of them, they are still in French, uh, they use the French language. And if you don't have the real, uh, you know, uh, uh, the real uh, background uh, mm -hmm. in French, and if you don't master the language, you cannot follow the courses in uh, those universities. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope you, I just have a few more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask audiences, uh, some of our audience for questions. I'm also interested in, 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 in asking about, well, first of all, my second question will be about the future, how you see the future um, in, in these different aspects. But um, to what extent are Libyans visible in the kind of the public sphere, that is to say in media? Do we see Libyan characters on television? Do we see uh, uh, Libyans popping up in, in literary studies or journalism? Or do they have a voice? Do they have a public voice? Um, do Tunisians actually get to read about what's going on with Libyans in, 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 in Libya or you know, the, 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 uh, li through literature, through culture? How much of the, the, the cultural space is now a shared space between uh, Tunisians and Libyans. Do we have any idea of that? Which is sure, uh, for sure, Tunisians, they are very much following what is going on in Libya and they are very much interested 
you know, uh, to see that uh, things will move to the right direction and Libya will get back to a normal normality in uh, very soon. Uh, in Tunisia, Libyans, they are quite discreet. Uh, you don't see much of them, you know, mm -hmm. on the TV uh, mm -hmm. programs or on, uh, uh, sometimes you see one or two professors mm -hmm. taking part but still they go back you know and they have their own television in libya and they are uh, and they have very good journalists you know uh, mm -hmm. but still in tunisia itself they don't interfere in the local politics uh, uh, and uh, we don't see much of them in our mm -hmm. media interesting that's an interesting uh, question uh, interesting point so my big question now is that um, let's make some assumptions that COVID is going to pass fairly soon, inshallah, and that uh, the Libyan government will unify in some ways. Let's just say five, 10 years. How do you see um, Libyan-Tunisian relations evolving or changing, uh, if, if at all? First of all, let's hope that both countries will succeed soon, you know, in their political transition. Uh, that we will be having both of us uh, real uh, uh, functioning democracies. Uh, if Libya tomorrow, if Tunisia finalize, uh, you know, its political and transition process, and then is able to overcome all these economic and social difficulties, and Libya again by the end of this year will be having a fully democratic you know, government, then uh, I think you are going to see in this part of the world a very promising uh, spot. Mm -hmm. uh, because if Tunisia and Libya become full democratic nations, open for business, and they make the right reforms, you know, to attract foreign investors and to uh, uh, use the human resources, wealth, you know, uh, Tunisian as well as Libyans, then I think uh, these, uh, these two countries will be uh, very soon emerging country. And I am, I am convinced that uh, after a few years, these two countries will be the hope of the whole region of the uh, MENA, MENA region. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna open um, the questions a little bit. Uh, to some of the audience to see. Uh, we have one, I'm gonna read you this question right now. I'm not gonna identify the sa'il, just the su'al. So I uh, hope you don't mind that. And I'm gonna read it to you. He says, many international organizations working on Libya settled in Tunisia. However, they have tremendous difficulties to operate legally. That is to open bank accounts, or to get long-term visas. Is that responding to security considerations or just bureaucratic archaism? Many international organizations. Let me start by saying that the ANSMIL, which is the main international organization related to the United Nations, has its headquarters here in Tunis uh, before moving to Libya and still have it still has an important headquarters here uh, in the center of Tunis. Uh, so I don't see any problems. I mean, when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, we didn't, I, they never raised, they never mentioned to me, you know, any problems of uh, uh, international organizations having difficulty to settle or to get visa. It, maybe he's uh, the uh, gentleman is, talking about NGOs. Uh, if it is uh, related to NGOs, I think NGOs, they are free and there are thousands of them operating now in Tunisia, but still many, like any other countries, uh, there are some, you know, uh, procedures to follow in order to get the agreement. And uh, I think, I don't think it's quite complicated agreement and uh, they, uh, they go through the central bank uh, and the uh, uh, prime minister's office and they get it soon. And there are thousands of foreign NGOs and foundations operating already in Tunisia. Okay. 
thank you very much. I'm going to go to a second question. Um, so this is not my question. I'm just going to read it. Please. How does how much does smuggling among the Tunisian Libyan border damage the Tunisian economy? It's a big issue. It's a big issue, and it's a nightmare for the Tunisian authorities uh, to control the border, uh, to uh, avoid, you know, uh, illicit smuggling of goods, but also illicit smuggling of arms. So smuggling is one of the major issue uh, in the relation between Tunisia and Libya. Uh, that's why, for security reason, if we shut down for the border, you know, for a while, and we did it once or twice, then the impact, the social impact of those people living from bringing in goods from Libya, particularly oil, and Tunisian taking out consumer good to the Libyan market, they start, you know, uh, making. Uh, uh, protestation and manifestation and they start, you know, uh, some riots and problems. So uh, smuggling and uh, uh, irregular uh, economy is one of the subjects which this government is working on because we have to integrate those sectors within the formal economy. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, another question. With Libya, with Libya, hopefully a peaceful settlement in Libya, what are the chances of linking the promising reconstruction process to the strategic aim of sub-regional Maghreb integration towards a more ambitious Middle East, North Africa, Amina integration? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, if, if Libya gets tomorrow a real functioning government and Tunisia also has its own stable uh, leadership and government, then uh, I think we are uh, putting the, the, the pillar for reviving the whole Maghreb because uh, Libya and Tunisia together could be really a kind of locomotive for uh, a new revival for, of the Maghreb project. Uh, already, already there are some infrastructure products, uh, projects which are underway. The other day I have seen that uh, Italy is starting negotiating with the Libyan government to continue building the highway linking Tunisia and Libya. There are, because our highway reach the end, almost the end, of uh, uh, just few hundreds kilometers, I think around 150 kilometers from the border, then if, if they bring the highway from Tripoli to Tunisian border, and then we will continue the building from our side, the highway that will help, you know, uh, Tunisians uh, going, you know, um, uh, Libyans going to Morocco through uh, by road, and Tunisian willing to go up to Egypt uh, by highway, which is going to be a very important tool for uh, economic integration for the whole region, uh, right. including right. Egypt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it brings me back. I have a, um, okay, there's another question. I was gonna ask a question, but you have another one coming in from, a, from an old friend of mine. Uh, Thanks to Mr. Janawi for this interesting overview and for organizing. You're welcome, Monsieur, Signore. I have two questions. How does Mr. Janawi judge the foreign policy of the current government in regard to Libya? And two, you want to answer that first, and then I'll 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 take the second part of this question. Would you prefer that? You know. Uh... I, I'm not going to judge the uh, current policy, but I am going to give you my view how uh, we should proceed with the Libyans, uh, because I think we have lost, lost a lot of uh, time uh, in the last uh, year, 
uh, not having the right contacts in Libya, and not being proactive with the Libyan government and with all the Libyans, regardless of their orientation or ideological affiliation. Uh, that's the policy which we tried to pursue when we were in power from 2014 to 2019, uh, 15 to uh, 2020, sorry. We tried to be in touch with all the Libyans, with all the factions, and trying to be, you know, a kind of working on the rapprochement uh, between the Libyan faction and pushing towards a peaceful settlement of the Libyan crisis. Tunisia has to, you know, resume such kind of role. Uh, it has an opportunity now till uh, the December 24th, 2021, to uh, uh, propose its own expertise on the political and constitutional uh, transition. We have already our own, our own experience and we could be useful if they want it to our Libyan friends. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see much of interaction uh, today with our Libyan uh, brothers. They are, uh, Tunisia has a very excellent perception in Libya uh, because uh, the only agenda which we uh, had since 2011 is to see Libya pacified and normalized and uh, to see that a peaceful settlement is reached as soon as possible. And the Libyan, they appreciate such, such kind of position. We have to build on that credit today to be more present and to say, uh, to try and find a way to uh, be more uh, uh, present in Libya, particularly when the competition uh, from the other quarters and other countries is quite ferocious. So uh, I think, uh, there is a deficit, unfortunately, from our side to interact with the Libyans, but still, even if we are, uh, uh, that deficit is there, still, I think, still we have time to uh, resume as soon as possible our uh, contacts with the Libyans, regardless of their affiliation, and particularly with the new government, which is uh, a very modern government, uh, trying, you know, to be a unity government for the whole region, for the whole Libya, and help it because uh, I don't, uh, Libya, the Libyan government still have many problems to handle uh, in the coming weeks and months, particularly on the security uh, field, and the Tunisian uh, should be there, uh, either bilaterally or with the tripart tripartite with other countries, and try to find uh, a way to uh, uh, be, you know, uh, uh, give the right advice to our uh, uh, Libyan friends. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, the second part of the same uh, questioner is, uh, whoever has lived in Tunis before the pandemic could appreciate the economic significance of the Libyan president presence in areas like Anasar and Awina. Don't you think that the local economy there is too dependent on Libyans' expenditure? I don't think because they are not the majority. I mean, they contribute to the economy of these areas, but still uh, because of the crisis, you know, in 2019 to 2019, uh, 18, sorry, their income uh, was reduced uh, because of the crisis going on in Libya. And, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, they are playing an important role, particularly in renting and, uh, uh, you know, consuming Tunisian goods, but I don't think it's, uh, this is vital. It's a kind of vital element for the, the, the economy of this uh, region. Okay. Uh, and next question is from an anonymous uh, uh, attendee. Uh, Tunisia was a minor player in the Libya pacification process. Do you think Tunisia will profit in a similar dimension uh, on the economic aspect? And do you think that security challenges will be easily waived on the Tunisian-Libya border borders? I First, I don't agree that Tunisia was a minor player. Tunisia was a bridge builder. 
it was not, it was not maybe a player, direct player on the ground because maybe we don't have the right means for that, but we were a bridge builder working with the Libyans and foreign partners to try to push towards you know, a peaceful settlement. Uh, don't forget that uh, Libya was in war, in the situation of war just a few months ago. And uh, uh, Tunisia was always that country which did not show any agenda, uh, any, uh, uh, any agenda to uh, shape the situation in Libya. But still, it has been, you know, uh, her, uh, our advice and our idea was always yeah, listened to by uh, other uh, friends. On the security, the security is one of the major issues between Tunisia and Libya. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when Libya was uh, almost with two government, with two armies, with many militias, and where there was no central government controlling the whole country, Tunisia was uh, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable uh, to uh, attacks, terrorist attacks coming from Libya. The 2015, 2016 attacks, all of them, they emanate, uh, they emanate and they were uh, made by terrorists who were one day, one time or another, you know, uh, uh, trained in Libya. Uh, that's why uh, we uh, spend and invest a lot on the security on the border, trying to uh, uh, build, you know, a kind of fence to control, to better control the, uh, the, the border between the two countries. But still, uh, I think one of the major problems which will be facing the new government in Libya is how to handle these security issues, how to handle all these militias, how do you, do you, they, do, they are going to decommission, decommission the uh, arms of those militias, you know, uh, around 20,000 foreign fighters and foreign uh, forces, uh, they are in Libya. And these, these forces have to leave. And if you have seen lately, the foreign minister of Libya made a declaration the new foreign lady, uh, the, the new lady foreign minister of Libya, she made the declaration asking uh, that the foreign forces leave as soon as possible the Libyan territory. And then immediately there was the response of the president of the uh, uh, state council who is from the Islamist uh, group. And he said that Libya has to respect uh, all the committed agreement with foreign countries, which means they don't, they have to respect the agreement signed with Turkey. So uh, this is a very delicate uh, uh, issue. Uh, I think it's going to be the hardest task for the new Libyan government to handle. Uh, and uh, the international community has to uh, support uh, this new Libyan government to handle as soon as possible, you know, this issue. And you have seen lately the declaration of the European Union and including also the United States asking uh, these foreign fighters to leave as soon as possible the Libyan territory. Thank you. Another question. Uh, did the coronavirus pandemic in Tunisia create an increased emphasis on technology uh, most importantly in the internet to enable business and education? And if so, do you see this emphasis encouraging youth to pursue employment in this sector as it becomes more important in daily life? Well, Tunisia, I think like most of the countries in the world now, they are using more digital uh, technology because of this pandemic. I think uh, schooling now and university professors they are giving their, uh, you know, conference and uh, lectures through the internet, through webinar. Uh, we have the human resources. One of the, I think the uh, most important achievement of Tunisia is to uh, uh, human resources in this kind of uh, digital uh, sectors. Uh, I don't think there is any shortage on that. And I think that's going to be the trend for the future uh, in Tunisia. Okay. 
Um, there's a question that that is it, that is asked, and it it in touches on what we've just talked about. But uh, in fairness to the question, I'm going to read it. It's a bit long, but uh, I'll read it slowly. Um, as a as a, a neighbor, as a C O M E S A neighbor, member of the Maghrebi region, we need to work more on our education vision for youth. As a partner of Tunisian education technology startup working on providing and assisting young students in getting admission to the UK and the USA universities, um, operating in Dubai, Morocco, Nigeria, et cetera, Egypt. What would be the first step to penetrate the Libyan market and to assist and get assisted by our Libyan partners? Um, I'll, I'll leave it at there. I think uh, you are uh, the, the 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 gentleman who asked this question is absolutely right, because education is the core of both system in Libya and Tunisia. Unless we reform our education system, we modernize that system and make it, you know, uh, more uh, uh, open for these the new. Uh, uh, digital tools, uh, we, we cannot succeed in the economic uh, sectors or in other sectors. So um, uh, Tunisia, as well as Libya, have to invest, I think, in reforming education, making, uh, putting more focus on quality education and uh, using new tools. And of course, uh, opening up to a university in the UK and uh, uh, US, uh, USA, but also Germany. Uh, by the way, uh, Tunisia has uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, young students, uh, you know, following their studies in uh, in German university, French university, uh, Canadian university, as well as uh, UK as, and the American university. So uh, this is this is a new trend now. For, for people who have the resources, you know, to send their uh, children abroad, particularly for post-graduation. And I think uh, today in this uh, globalized world, it's very important to, uh, uh, you know, interact, particularly among youth uh, of different countries and learn, you know, new tools uh, for education. Uh, the audience attendee who posed that very wonderful uh, question just now on education and technology has just event, uh, called to my attention that she is a woman. So I wanted to thank you, Madame, for asking this uh, uh, very wonderful question, uh, duly noted. Um, and I'm going to go one last see if I've got another question here. Um, I think we've covered all of the I'm going to go one more time to go in advance. And I think if I may ask one last question, because we have about five minutes. There are two other questions. I, I, I haven't seen them. Where are uh, they? They're in the chat. Um, I may ask. There is potential economic synergy between Tunisia and Libya. Can this be progressed and realized? Can there be a common market between Tunisia and Libya? Oh, this is already discussed. And then I, I group questions so that you- That's just that the first one is enough. Just yeah. go ahead, let them go. I, I, I don't think that on this stage, we can uh, talk about uh, free uh, trade area between Libya and Tunisia. First of all, we have to consolidate both government. Uh, we have to create you know, the foundation for a democratic system in Tunisia as well as in Libya and then start you know, cooperating in complementary fields. I mean, where Tunisia can be useful to Libya and where Libya can be useful to Tunisia. For example, Tunisia imports oil. Instead of importing oil from Azerbaijan, which we are doing today, we should import it from next door, from Libya. Then we have to find the right way, you know, to uh, uh, particularly for payment, how to pay our Libyan uh, neighbors, you know, to import their oil and refine it in our, ref our refineries here in Tunisia. Uh, then, then when we uh, create new uh, dynamism uh, between the two countries, then I think uh, 
uh, it will be very obvious that we can start of having you know a discussion about uh, creating a free trade area between the two countries. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And I have one final question. And again, it's a big question, but I'll raise it just as well. I'll read it just as well. Thank you for your thoughts and presence today. You have touched upon a sensitive issue, current and future relations between Libyan Islamists supported by Turkey and Tunisian Islamists struggling to control what is historically a progressive secular society. It would appear that there is a danger that Libya's current political change could strengthen Tunisia's Islamist trend. Is this a concern in your view in Tunisia? Well, I think uh, it must be a concern for everybody, for the Libyan as well as for the Tunisian. Uh, I, 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 I have a strong belief that uh, Islamists, uh, of course, they are part of the Tunisian society, but they will never be able to change the character or the model of the Tunisian society. Tunisia has been always an open country, uh, modern countries. It has been a Muslim country for the last 14 centuries. I don't see why today we have to change our model of living. Uh, Libya is a different uh, because Libya, uh, it has been under influence from different other quarters. Of course, uh, what is going on li on Libya now, it is not, you know, contrary to the belief of many observers, uh, Turkey is interfering in Libya, not because of the Islamist or ideological uh, objectives. It's more for economic and security objectives. And uh, Turkey uh, wants to be uh, present you know, to take part in the reconstruction process, which will be will open after the election. And that's why they are massively present in, uh, in Libya, uh, like uh, it Italy or France or any other countries. Uh, but I don't think that uh, political Islam has any future in this part of the world. It's, they are part of our society. We have to respect them. We have to give them all the freedom, you know, to act uh, freely in the country like any other uh, citizens. But uh, I don't think Tunisian as well as Libyan will permit you know, for any minority to change the model of society, uh, particularly in Tunisia. And I'm speaking about the Tunisia because this is my country, which I know. Uh, I don't think that they will be able to change the, they are trying. Uh, uh, now the era of ideology is almost over. Uh, we have to concentrate and focus now on the ways how to create prosperity for our young generations, how to make them more connected with the rest of the world, how to contribute to human, you know, pro human production. Uh, from, uh, I mean, economic as well as intellectual production, instead of looking back, you know, 14 centuries and trying to force people to uh, pursue, you know, and follow some uh, uh, religious uh, way of living. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I see that our time is just about ended with uh, two minutes left. I just wanted to leave the last word for you if you'd like to uh, make any final comments. This has been a most informative and a most engaging uh, conversation with you. And we wanna thank you so much for sharing your, your expertise, your knowledge and your expertise with us. And I thought I've, you'd like to make some last comments uh, for us. Uh, well, uh, for, uh, once again, thank you very much for hosting me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about different subjects related to the Tunisian Libyan relation. Uh, of course, I am not an expert of such uh, subject. Uh, you asked me a few specific questions where, which I was not able to answer because uh, honestly, I didn't uh, focus on those uh, questions. But uh, still, uh, this, is, this, is, this region uh, should be, I think, uh, the subject of attention of our friends all over the world, particularly in the United States because this is a region which is going through transformation. And if we succeed, and I hope we will be succeeding in our own transformation, 
uh, it will be very good for our own population, but it will impact the whole region. That's why uh, the experience going on in Tunisia and uh, as well as in Libya, they are not just domestic experience. They have also international dimension, which be, uh, should be looked uh, after, particularly with uh, renewed and uh, famous uh, university like uh, yours, the Harvard University. Thank you very much, sir. And we end with my best wishes to you. Special thanks to your families and to all who attended for good health, um, high spirits, and a blessed Ramadan, the completion of Ramadan for, for all of us. Uh, thank you very much. Shukran and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.